Here's a patch that I made last week. It's a nice, fairly standard pad, but there's something interesting behind the scenes. I'm using four different chorusing methods simultaneously. Pitch modulation, delay modulation, modulation of a comb filter, and then a standard chorusing effect at the end for good measure. To understand how these methods all achieve the same result, we'll need to take a tour through the history of chorus. Along the way, we'll learn about pipe organs, delay lines, and a blurry area in between analog and digital, known as discrete time. The goal of chorus is to create a duplicate detuned signal. Now with digital technology, that's pretty easy to do, but pre-digital, it was a little more complicated. The first chorusing was done acoustically, sometimes with an actual chorus. A group of musicians or singers would perform the same part simultaneously to thicken the sound. Eventually, instruments were created that integrated this effect into their designs. For example, pianos, which utilize sets of equivalently tuned strings. Organ designers, who were in a way the first synth builders, brought about two significant innovations. The first from the mid-1800s was the voix celeste. The voix celeste is a pipe organ stop that used detuned sets of pipes to create rhythmic beating when used in conjunction with another stop. In retrospect, we can see this as a precursor to today's detuned oscillators, but at the time the effect was achieved acoustically through different lengths of pipes. In the 1940s, organists hit upon another innovation when the Leslie speaker became the first method to impose chorus on an already existing sound. The Leslie used sets of rotating speakers to take advantage of the Doppler effect. In the standard design, a motor rotates two opposite-facing speakers to play the treble frequencies, while the bass frequencies are played into a rotating drum with a curved baffle. This design achieves two pretty important things. First, we move from acoustic chorus to electromechanically generated chorus. We've also added what would become a staple of chorus effects, modulation. The Doppler effect creates a rising pitch as the speaker moves towards the listener and a sinking pitch as the speaker moves away. So the two treble horns create duplicate signals with inverted modulation, while the bass speaker creates one signal with vibrato. Meanwhile, the rotation also creates amplitude modulation from the changing directionality of the sound and timbral modulation from interactions with the enclosure. Here's a super clinical recreation of the effects. An LFO modulates two key-synced oscillators in different directions. The amplitude is modulated by an LFO at the same speed, but shifted phase. Another layer produces the effect of the vibrato bass speaker. In the 1960s, another milestone was passed as we transitioned from electromechanically generated chorus to tape-based analog chorus. In 1966, an engineer at Abbey Road, Ken Townsend, created automatic double tracking, a technique using a second tape machine to combine a signal with a delayed version of itself. By changing the speed of the tape machine, Townsend was able to incorporate detune and add more variation to the duplicate. If he maintained a static detune, as per the voix celeste, the tape machines would drift further and further out of sync. But by oscillating the speed of the duplicate, he could create detune and vary the delay time without experiencing drift. This method can create effects similar to modern chorus or flanging. This is due to comb filtering. A comb filter is a series of regularly spaced notches that occur when you add a delayed version of a signal to itself. Here's the Quantum's comb filter model. By modulating the delay time, we can replicate the effect of the wobbling tape speed, creating the familiar chorusing effect. Throughout the 1960s, tape manipulation was the only way to achieve this effect, but a design from 1969 was about to usher in the age of modern chorusing. A bucket brigade device is essentially a line of capacitors controlled by a clock oscillator. With each cycle of the clock oscillator, the charge in each capacitor is transferred into the next capacitor in the chain. Meanwhile, the current level of your input signal is captured by the first capacitor in the chain. Let's imagine a simple three-stage bucket brigade device, with an input at zero and an output at four. At the first clock cycle, capacitor one samples the current level of your input signal. At the second clock cycle, that level is transferred into capacitor two as capacitor one samples the new level of your input signal. At the third clock cycle, two moves to three, one moves to two, and one once again samples your input signal. At the fourth cycle, two moves to three, one moves to two, three reaches the output, and one once again samples your input. Your input signal is essentially chopped into segments, put through a time-consuming obstacle course, and reconstructed at the output. 
The implications of this are kind of massive. We've moved from acoustic to electromechanical to analog to something else. In analog signals, amplitude and time are continuous. But in a bucket brigade device, we sample a continuous range of amplitudes at discontinuous time intervals. Because of this, our resulting signal technically isn't analog. It's discrete time. Now let's consider how this signal is affected by changes in clock speed. A section of your input signal is already sampled into the capacitors, so by changing the clock speed, you're reconstructing that signal at a different rate than it was sampled at. This results in a pitch shift, so by using an LFO to modulate the delay time, we can create a duplicate signal that oscillates above and below our dry signal. With a 100% where it mix, we can even hear this vibrato signal on its own. Over time, modifications have been made to this design, but the general concept stayed the same. Multiple choruses with differing rates and phases were combined to further thicken the sound, with stereo panning contributing to a greater sense of space. The invention of digital delay allowed designers to remove the filtering and distortion inherent in bucket brigade choruses. And by the 1990s, more advanced digital pitch shifting methods made even static detune possible. So now that we've taken a sweeping tour through the history of chorus, let's do some practical experimentation. Let's start with three sawtooth oscillators. To keep the oscillators as close to true duplicates as possible, I'm turning off pitch variance and turning on key reset. Next, let's set our first LFO to detune oscillators 2 and 3 with opposite modulation, similar to the effect of a Leslie treble horn. Now let's add a comb filter and modulate the delay time with LFO 2. Then we'll activate two delays with zero feedback and stereo panning. Using LFOs 3 and 4 to modulate the times of these delays, we can add two more choruses to our patch. Now we can add a standard chorus effect and a reverb to the output. Now let's add some static detune by creating detune kernels within each oscillator. With a little tweaking to the filters and envelopes, this can result in an excessive, decadent chorus pad. In future episodes, we'll return to the topic of delay-based effects and comb filtering. But as far as chorusing goes, this is plenty to experiment with. If you enjoyed this episode, support me on Patreon for one-on-one -on -one synth lessons and bonus tutorials. As always, this has been Synth Fundamentals. Thanks for watching.